Thank you. Um, uh, one thing I wanted to say, and I'll tell Jeff first that he's going to do a TV interview, but uh, one of the reasons I'm in this mess in the first place is uh, when I was an undergraduate at Columbia University in the 70s, um, I took a course with Seymour Mellon called the uh, Permanent War Economy of the United States. And uh, Jeff Duma was working with Seymour, he would occasionally lecture the class. And I was a philosophy major, and I was sort of learning about how to think, but I didn't have anything to think about. So, uh, so Seymour Mellon's class was quite compelling in that regard. Uh, and then I went uh, out of school, uh, not having a plan, um, to work at a place called the Council on Economic Priorities, uh, in a project called the Conversion Information Center. Uh, not religious conversion, but um, uh, conversion of the military economy. Uh, and that, the money for that was raised by Gordon Adams, who was also mentioned earlier as one of the people who's worked on this for a long time. So uh, I had great encouragement early in my uh, career to, to do this work, and I'm going to keep doing it until we get it right. Um, So the, the most challenging thing about talking about the military industrial complex is uh, you don't really want to depress people, you know. Uh, and I used to give these long speeches with these exquisite analyses of the military industrial complex and people would say, you know, you're right, Bill, I'm going home and maybe I'll go to the beach because it's hopeless. Um, so I'm going to try to avoid that. Um, but if I doubt Elizabeth, it's going to be hope. So uh, even if I fail at my mission, I have backup. Um, so uh, yeah, so the first thing to think about, and it was uh, referenced in this Howard Zinn article that was passed around, um, is that we can win even about uh, against very powerful interests. Uh, if you look at the anti-Vietnam War movement, if you look for the campaign for a nuclear freeze, where you had Ronald Reagan coming in, joking about how the bombing would stop in five minutes, calling the Soviet Union the evil empire, launching a big nuclear buildup, and by the end of his term, uh, reducing nuclear weapons and saying nuclear war can never be won and should never be fought. That wasn't just some change of thinking for Ronald Reagan, that was because there was a movement uh, pushing in that direction. Um, if you look at the awful things that were happening in Central America in the 80s, how movements here helped push things towards a peace agreement there. Uh, the anti-apartheid movement, uh, where of course the, the lead was taken in South Africa by the African National Congress, the Black Consciousness Movement, but the global anti-apartheid divestment movement helped move that process along. Um, currently, and this is, is still in process, but um, a lot of us have been working on trying to end U.S. support uh, for the brutal Saudi-led war in Yemen, uh, which is supplied with uh, U.S. weapons and U.S. support. U.S. is essentially a partner with Saudi Arabia in that uh, slaughter that's happening. And um, we made progress in Congress. Uh, there's a coalition of humanitarian and human rights and peace groups that's gotten Congress to vote under the War Powers Act, the first time it's been effectively uh, passed in Congress to call for a, an end of U.S. support for the Saudi war. Uh, Congress has voted on several arms deals to uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, so it's a, by the standards of Congress, which usually lets these things fly through without a discouraging word, uh, we, we've got Congress activated on a bipartisan basis. Um, but of course, there's an obstacle. Um, he or shall not be named in the White House. Because um, I don't want to encourage him by you know, using his name. Um, uh, some people call him 45, which is one way to go. Um, you know, sort of like cult 45 malt liquor, which used to make me ill. Um, but um, in any case, my point being, uh, there are moments where all this organizing comes together and we make progress. And, and you never know exactly when that's going to be. But I feel that we're at a turning point where we're going to see a surge of act, not just activism, but uh, victories on our issues. If you look at the the climate strike yesterday um, in New York, uh, 250,000 people gathered, uh, mostly students, uh, many of them teenagers, to say, you know, we're not going to let politicians just talk to have to talk anymore, take selfies with us and say how admirable we are. Uh, we're going to make them change policy. 
and we're not going away. So uh, I think for all those reasons, if it seems depressing in the middle of the speech, just remember what I said at the beginning. Um, so uh, as was referenced, we're spending huge sums on the military. Uh, the deal that was made this year would spend $738 billion on the Pentagon and nuclear weapons at the Department of Energy. Uh, and then for next year, $750 billion. So over $1.4 trillion in two years, uh, which is one of the highest levels ever, um, higher than during Korean War, Vietnam War, peak of the Reagan buildup. Um, the only time we had spent more was when we had 180,000 troops in Iraq and Afghanistan. There's now about 20 to 25,000, and we're spending very similar amounts because the Pentagon never gives anything up without a fight. Um, and as David Wiley mentioned, uh, if you look at the full picture uh, of our national security state, uh, so that would include the cost of taking care of our veterans, homeland security, military aid, the uh, intelligence community, uh, the cost of paying off the interest on the debt from our military ventures. Uh, and then you're talking about $1.2 trillion a year. So pushing towards double the, the uh, acknowledged uh, Pentagon budget. Um, so that's a lot of resources that could be used for something more productive. Um, and just to give another example of how skewed our priorities are, uh, Lockheed Martin, my favorite company to dislike, um, gets in a, in a given year anywhere from 30 to 40 to 50 billion dollars in government contracts, uh, which is larger than the budget for the entire Department of State. Um, so we're spending more on weapons by this one company than we're spending on diplomacy. Uh, and that's, you know, a huge problem. Um, so the, the title of the talk mentioned waste and bloat. So I have to talk about that. Um, uh, you know, there's things like, um, there's, there's small examples of waste, like spending a hundred times on a spare part what you could buy off the shelf. Um, there's cost overruns, like aircraft carriers that end up costing $13 billion instead of only $8 billion. Uh, there's the F-35 combat aircraft, which thankfully or not may never be ready for combat. Um, it depends how you feel about whether you feel like discernment through competence is a good goal. You know, that's well over budget. They're going to spend more on that program than any other weapons program in history. So there's sort of the small waste, like the spare parts. There's the cost overruns of the big weapon systems. There's the bureaucracy. Uh, the Pentagon employs about 600,000 or so uh, private contractors on top of the Pentagon's uh, government bureaucracy. And many of those, it's not really clear what they do. A lot of them do things that are redundant to what government employees do. Uh, Secretary of Defense Robert Gates a few years ago admitted that you don't actually have a full count of how many contractors uh, they employ uh, because the Pentagon has never been successfully audited. Uh, so there's a lot of room for waste and fraud there when you're not even keeping track of how you're spending the money. Um, and then there was a report by this uh, Thing called the Defense Business Board, which is an advisory board to the Pentagon, that said uh, they can get rid of about $125 billion worth of bureaucratic spending over a five year period. Uh, so there, there's all those forms of waste. Um, but, you know, that's, that's about money. Uh, but there's also obviously lives at stake. Um, and if you look at things like the nuclear weapons buildup, where the uh, Pentagon wants to buy new bombers, new land-based missiles, new nuclear submarines, new missile to bombs submarines, new cruise missiles, new loaded weapons, pretty much any nuclear weapon you can think of or think about thinking of. Uh, they, they want to spend money on to the tune of well over a trillion dollars over the next two decades. So obviously that's not making us any safer. That's making nuclear war more likely. Um, so, I mean, that falls under the category of waste writ large. Um, and then, of course, there's our wars. Uh, and we've been at war continuously throughout the century. Uh, and the cost of war project at Brown University is estimated uh, that if you look at both the direct cost of the wars and also the cost of taking care of the veterans of the wars going forward, 
uh, the tab is about $5.9 trillion. Um, every once in a while, uh, Donald Trump, whose name I'm not supposed to mention, um, will say things like, yeah, we're spending, you know, we spent $7 trillion uh, on these wars and we could have been using it to rebuild America. Um, of course, he hasn't done anything to underscore or carry out that rhetoric, but uh, I think the fact that he felt the need to say it is because some among his base are also sick of war. Um, and, um, you know, these wars have killed, at a minimum, 350,000 people on all sides worldwide. Um, thousands of U.S. military personnel killed, and hundreds of thousands coming back with either severe physical injuries, traumatic brain injuries, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome. And that's one of the reasons that if we do right by these folks, the cost of these wars are going to go on for for generations. Um, and then there's the sort of security, which is that uh, when you devastate countries like has been done, you actually create a breeding ground for terrorism. Um, and there's a guy named James Marini who's got a new book about the uh, battle to drive ISIS out of Mosul in Iraq. And he was interviewed by C.J. Chivers, a very good reporter for the Times. Um, and he said a couple of things that were relevant. You know, he said, um, you know, Iraq became a locus of terrorism only after the U.S. invasion. And the reason he thinks so many Iraqis uh, didn't put up resistance when ISIS swept in uh, to take over large parts of Iraq uh, was, uh, and, and I quote, they were so brutalized, so desperate that the movement seemed like a viable alternative because they had seen relatives killed and be humiliated by the military. Uh, their children had been denied, denied viable features. The feeling was, you know, how much worse can it get? And they learned that it could, in fact, get much worse. But that did not, that was not part of the calculation when ISIS first came in. And of course, there was corruption. Many of the Iraqi military personnel didn't have appropriate weapons or even food. Uh, there was a lot of desertion. There were ghost soldiers where basically the commander collects money for salary for a soldier that doesn't exist, which is a good way to pad your bank account, by the way. Um, so, in any case, so you've, you've got, you're creating the uh, conditions of insecurity that increase the problem that you're claiming you're trying to solve through military force. Um, so the question arises, what can be done? Um, and on a small scale, uh, you know, like a short-term scale, uh, Congress is debating uh, finishing up the uh, National Defense Authorization Act, which is the bill that kind of sets policy for the Pentagon. And there's a number of important things at risk there, uh, at issue. Uh, one is there's a couple uh, amendments that would stop U.S. support uh, for the Saudi war in Yemen, uh, both spare parts and maintenance of the Saudi Air Force, and also the bombs that are being used uh, to kill civilians. Uh, there's a, a provision that would stop the development of low-yield nuclear weapons, which is one of those, you know, Dr. Strangelove concepts, which is like, you know, well, you know, if we're going to detour them, they have to believe we would use our nuclear weapons. And we might not use them if they're too large, but if they're smaller, they might believe we're going to use them. Uh, and so therefore, we'll have smaller nuclear weapons. Um, you know, only in the Pentagon could you come up with this kind of logic. Uh, and anyways, the, the, the net result is they're more likely to use these things. And so they shouldn't be, that would be built. Um, there's also a provision in the bill that would um, require uh, the president to go to Congress before starting a war with Iran. Uh, and there's a provision that would say um, uh, Donald Trump is deregulating the export of firearms. Uh, they used to be regulated by the State Department. At least they go through some human rights vetting, some security considerations. And now they, he wants the Department of Commerce to regulate them. And of course, the point of the Department of Commerce is to sell stuff. So they're not going to do those kinds of vettings, and it's going to be easier for these firearms to get into the hands of uh, dictators, terrorists, criminal gangs. Uh, so there's a provision that would, would block that. Um, and there's groups like um, Friends Committee on Financial Legislation that keep kind of a scorecard and tell you how to contact your member and so forth, uh, you know, if you want to weigh in in the short term. Um, so those are a, a few of the background points. Now I can get to the potentially depressing part, uh, which is what we're up against. 
which is the military industrial complex. And they have many levers of influence. Of course, like every other industry, they make campaign contributions. And in the last two cycles, um, election cycles, they've spent about $35 million, um, which actually isn't as much as, say, pharmaceuticals or banks. Uh, but they know how to spend it. You know, so they spend it on the head of the Armed Services Committee, the head of the Defense Appropriations Committee, uh, head, you know, people on the Budget Committee, the people who make the decisions about how much money they're going to get from us. Um, uh, then they also spend, in the last two cycles, $250 million on lobbying, so a quarter of a trillion dollars in just four years. Um, and a lot of their lobbyists come straight from government. Uh, they've worked at the Pentagon, they've worked at Congress. They can easily go back to their former colleagues and say, hey, you know, give my company a break here. You know, maybe you can work for us someday. Um, so there's that. And the Project on Government Oversight uh, did a report called uh, Brass Parachutes, where they found that in 2018 alone, there were at least 645 senior government officials who went to work for the weapons industry in one capacity or another. Um, so there's that, that they have on their side. Uh, then, of course, there's jobs, 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 uh, which Jeff mentioned. Um, and Donald Trump is obsessed with this aspect of the issue. Uh, so he claims uh, that there are huge numbers of jobs from uh, selling weapons to Saudi Arabia. And the fact that they're murdering people, including the journalist Jamal Khashoggi, to Trump is, is secondary. The point is there's jobs to be had, there's money to be had, I'm the big deal maker, uh, so let's let that uh, prevail in our decisions. Um, now I looked at Trump's claims and it ends up, he's claimed as many as a million jobs from Saudi arms sales. It looks like it's about 20 to 40,000, which is not nothing, but it's a small percentage of a percentage of the size of our economy. I think Donald Trump would like us to believe we'd fall into the ocean if we weren't selling to Saudi dictatorship, uh, and that's not the case. Uh, or if you look at the F-35 combat aircraft, uh, Lockheed Martin has a little handy map on their website where you can punch on your state, and they'll tell you how many jobs they claim there are building parts of the F-35. So I looked into that, and they were claiming about twice as many jobs as actually were created. And also, it was concentrated in a few states, uh, California, Texas, uh, Georgia. They claimed it was everywhere every state, every district, but it ends up, you know, in Nebraska, they, they came up with one job related, which is probably, I don't know if it was a paper clip or what. Um, so, anyway, so there's the exaggeration factor. Also, it's the worst way to create jobs. Any other way of creating jobs creates one and a half or more times as many jobs as spending on the Pentagon. So, green energy, infrastructure, education, healthcare, and so forth. Um, but as, you know, as Jeff pointed out, you need to be investing in those things. You know, if you, if you have an actual choice to work in another field, that resistance would be much less. But if your choice is, you know, I'm gonna be a welder at a submarine plant making union wages, or I can be a greeter at the local casino, that trade-off doesn't look so good. But if the trade-off is, you know, I can work in the energy sector, make a comparable amount of money, helping resolve the issue of climate change, versus building a weapon that's going to be used to kill innocent people halfway around the world, that, that's a much more uh, you know, in, uh, enticing trade-off that I think workers in the sector would be willing to, to make. Um, the other thing that the industry does is we, oh, it's either the peace sign or two minutes. Um, <laughs> I'll take it as the peace sign and go for two minutes. Um, so, um, the, the industry funds think tanks, uh, which do their bidding for them. So you'll hear these experts on TV, and uh, they'll tell you why you need the latest weapon and why we can't possibly pull out of Afghanistan. And ends up there on the payrolls of the companies that are profiting from these wars. Um, you even have, they, they shape policy. Uh, there was a commission, the National Defense Strategy Commission, the Congress Commission, uh, that was supposed to look at our national defense strategy with a critical eye. And so, looking at it with a critical eye, they decided we're not spending enough. And, you know, uh, it ends up more than half of them have ties to the defense industry, including the co-chair was on the board of Northrop Grumman. Um, so they insinuate themselves into the policy-making process. Um, 
So anyway, um, you know, that's clearly a very powerful and very kind of cynical sector that we have to capture and deal with. I think part of the thing is, is politics, you know, just outnumbering them and, and using people power to counter their lobby. Uh, and there have been cases where we have beaten them, even though I think the peace movement has three registered lobbyists and they have a thousand. Um, uh, but also, uh, I think because the country's in motion, that's with the climate strike, um, there's just going to be a lot more opportunities uh, to go up against these folks and, and argue for a senior policy. And as I said, uh, Elizabeth is actually going to give us the real hope. And so I'm passing the baton to her.